Finding our home among the stars. With Richard Dynan, founder of Pulsar Fusion. Welcome back to the Cosmic Companion with James Maynard. This week, kicking off the second half of our seventh season, we offer you a look at how the human race might take our first steps to becoming an interplanetary species. Later in the show, we're going to be talking with Richard Dynan, founder and CEO of Pulsar Fusion, about spacecraft powered by nuclear fusion. Neato, Wally! The first step in our cosmic odyssey is the establishment of networks of space stations in low Earth orbit. These floating havens will be our training ground for learning to live and work in the unforgiving environment of space. As we extend our stays on these celestial platforms, we're going to perfect life support systems, sustainable recycling techniques, and develop revolutionary 3D printing technologies capable of assembling structures in space without human assistance. This technology would allow anyone to design homes on Earth or beyond from simple rotating spheres to mid-century modern or their own Barbie-themed space station. Some of these outposts would also serve as spaceports, launching supplies and human crews to far-flung destinations. Without the need to escape the atmosphere of Earth, spaceflight will become far easier, safer, and much less expensive. With space stations as our stepping stones, the next destination on our voyage is the Moon. The Moon has always beckoned us with its silvery charm, and now, with modern technology at our fingertips, we have the means to make it our second home. A lunar outpost station, including robotic explorers, mapping the terrain and scouting ideal locations for our lunar bases, is the next step in reaching for the stars. The south pole of the moon is home to vast storehouses of water ice, which could be harvested and converted into drinkable water and breathable oxygen. Additionally, it's a valuable resource for hydrogen, an essential element for fueling spacecraft and sustaining habitations. To propel us toward these extraterrestrial destinations, we'll need powerful, efficient engines. And that's where nuclear fusion technology likely comes into play. Now, nuclear fusion engines are basically the holy grail of propulsion, producing energy by fusing atoms together much like our sun. Imagine the potential, abundant, clean energy that could fuel spacecraft for interplanetary travel. So it remains a challenging feat to master, but this field is accelerating, and it holds the key to widespread human habitation of space. Next up, we're going to talk with one of the visionaries creating this powerhouse to the stars, Richard Dynan, founder and CEO of Pulsar Fusion. Looking deep into the universe, we see backwards in time. And the oldest light in the universe holds secrets to how everything around us will, one day, end. Meanwhile, stars, planets, and galaxies dance in an intricate ballet, occasionally giving birth to life. We are a fledgling species, just beginning to visit other worlds. We are a way for the universe to understand itself. The Cosmic Companion strives to bring the universe down to Earth. And we depend on your help to make it happen. For information on subscriptions and ways to donate to this program, please visit thecosmiccompanion.net. Thank you. This week on The Cosmic Companion, we are happy to be joined by Richard Dynan. He is founder and CEO of Pulsar Fusion, and he's looking at offering the human race a neat new way of getting around our solar system and maybe beyond. Welcome to the show, Richard. Thank you very much. Yeah, pleasure to have you here. Uh, so can you give us just a brief look at what is 
Pulsar Fusion, and what is it that you folks are hoping to do? Pulsar is a uh, British-based in-space propulsion company. So we focus on, once you've launched and you're in orbit, we focus on those kind of propulsion systems. Um, so principally, that is stage two rocket engines. Uh, we, we, we build liquid hydrogen and um, uh, hybrid hybrid rocket motors. Uh, and we also focus, we have a, a big department in electric propulsion. So uh, a Hall effect thrusters specifically, which is a type of plasma um, ion engine. But Pulsar is called Pulsar Fusion because we have an, uh, an overriding moonshot ambition of nuclear fusion for propulsion, which makes us pretty unique. It also makes us unique in fusion because a lot of fusion companies are betting everything on um, one route to fusion, if you like. And, you know, there will be many, uh, many routes, but also uh, as an investor, it, it's kind of make or break. Whereas we have our, uh, our, our fusion drive ambition, but we also have a, a good good pulse um, business beneath that. And, you know, we really listen to what the market uh, is looking for. Mm -hmm. And as you alluded to, I mean, you folks do some different types of engines, including liquid hydrogen and more familiar ion engines, and as well as your nuclear fusion technologies. Can you just give, give us a brief look at what some of the advantages and disadvantages are of each type of propulsion system and why you need yes yeah, so, well we came very uh the journey was um it was a very important uh when you've got a lot of physicists around you um that you know everybody's excited by a lot of technology and it's very important to say no because <laughs> <laughs> um, otherwise you'd be building all sorts of things so it's our, our, the technologies we have chosen to invest in are very strategic to us um and we addressed each one uh you know, a lot of things we've, we've looked at we've addressed each one um carefully before we've invested in it uh to touch on the rocket engines that came second we actually um we primarily started with e with ep because our nuclear fusion scientists are all plasma physicists right so um the study of electromagnetic uh confinement of plasma is very very relevant to hall effect thrusters uh, and those scientists uh, have a really uh, a great pedigree to be building ion engines and it gives us you know we've got the vacuum chambers um we've got all the uh simulation studies uh, and we've got all the sort of clean room apparatus and the things that you the same thing you need for fusion uh you need for ep so that was very logical for us um we didn't necessarily set out uh to make a market uh in the smaller engines we build now we started off with very large hall effect thrusters i mean the largest and uh, as we sort of, our main study was in longevity, wasn't in making them live longer. Uh, sorry, it wasn't in making them more powerful necessarily, because I think there's, there's kind of a glass ceiling to where you can take uh, electrostatic propulsion, but um, it was more making them live longer. If you're going to spend the money to put something in space, uh, you want it to be able to survive 15 years. And, and the material science behind that grew our EP for us so that it was a pretty pretty easy for us to to, to continue doing something that there was a clear demand for. Um, and we got a lot of support from the UK government, the space agency behind that. It's made some pretty amazing partnerships um, recently with the University of Michigan. Uh, and we've done um, a lot of the British Center for Excellence. Uh, so that's a, it's a really exciting place to be um, with the whole of the Rocket engines, uh, again, came to us because from our success with EP, we found that there are not many people in this part of the world who are seriously building stage two rocket engines. And, and again, if you're putting things into space, whether it be for asteroid mining or, or all sorts of ends of cislunar uh, missions, you do want, there, there, there's got to be other ways of navigating. And we don't travel meaningful distances in space by setting fire to things. Mm -hmm. uh, it's very good for getting us up there, but once we're there, you want something more efficient or something that can refuel in orbit, um, which is which is where the demand came for us with with your personnel and facilities. Can you build this tech? So again, we started doing these tests in about 2020. Uh, you see sort of our rocket engines doing test fires in Switzerland in the snow. 
which was very unique. But uh, that, that again, something we we again focus on specifically strategic stage two engines. Um, and fusion is for us, it's kind of a no brainer. It's um, it, it, can you do fusion for energy? Is the question I think a lot of people are, have on their mind, and we can. Um, you know, you saw the success at the NIF facilities, and there's been more. There'll be more and more. Uh, but ultimately, the myth of you know, can we do it? Can we achieve the conditions? Yeah, we absolutely can, and we'll do more and more of it. The people at these people say, okay, well, when will it power our homes then? If this is happening, the problem is, is once you've got the condition of fusion, turning that into a power station. A serious uh, industrial, you know, it's a federal sized, um, massive power station, a power station infrastructure thing. And, and they always take 10 to 15 years, just whether it be fission or fusion, it's a federal sized game. And sometimes it's best to, uh, you know, that, that's not where we, we wanted to be involved in. But if you kind of get that same initial condition of fusion, what we call fusion triple product or um, Lawson criteria, I mean, the different ways of setting it up level Q um, to get a fusion burn, then you can use that same condition to create exhaust speeds, which are you know, an order of magnitude. I mean, 10x plus uh, the, the speeds we currently get from our Hall effect thrusters. But more importantly, apart from the speed, you get the, a bit more of the sort of the, the mass, for, for example, um, Hall effect thrusters give you that super fast, about 32 kilometers a second in particle speeds. But to get, get there would take 100 years to get to that speed. You know, it's a very slow acceleration, whereas a rocket engine gives you that kick instantly. So we haven't got anything that does both. Fusion is the only technology um, that really could mean that we could leave our solar system within a human lifetime, whether that's something we'd want to do. Uh, it, it's more not, a, we, we say things about going to Mars or going to Saturn, that's sort of to get people's head around the speed. The most important thing is um, getting to a point in space quicker than someone else or faster to make things commercial. Or if I can save you time and space, uh, I can save you money. So um, for us, there's no other tech that we can seriously consider. We can definitely get those conditions of fusion requires. So with or without us, we're using fusion for propulsion. As I mean, as humanity, we will be doing that. Mm, and you're talking about, as you as you mentioned, like the this could give us the ability to go to Mars in weeks rather than uh, months, or you know, making this whole journey back and forth you know a matter of weeks like a cruise yeah i mean we we, we the analogies are calculated you know you get to saturn's moon titan or in i think it takes eight years is reduced to two that's what the math said but again i mean this is there's, you know there's, there's like deceleration there's in-orbit assemblies to consider there's um what's things like that but you know i, I think those missions are people say, "Why do I want to get to Mars?" or "Why do I want to get to Saturn?" Um, you know, there are there are ways of doing fusion where perhaps you could use some kind of inertial confinement concepts where you're colliding asteroids in, you know, you're slingshotting around planets, and all of this is very elegant and and, mm -hmm. and interesting. But actually, once you're in space, space is a massive place, right? And to travel anywhere meaningful, uh, setting fire to things and combustion rockets is is ultimately not the right way of you know we know that nature the stars we follow in the direction you've got to emulate them and 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 fusion is nature's chosen power source um the sun is a fusion reactor so we know that's the way to go um we just haven't really had the tech i mean now now we have the ability to to get as you see we, we can get there now so using it for propulsion is is a much more near-term application than using it for energy you know, we don't need a huge power station or steam turbines. We don't need to breed our own tritium. We don't need to have um, maybe two engines and robotic hat or seawater flush out. So we don't need neutron, um, you know, to ca capture the neutron uh, uh, kinetic energy for heat. We don't need to have the 
locals to sign off on it, the governments to finance it. We do, all of that is the enormous time lag of energy. We can just build it in a chamber. It has to make sure that we're getting those exhaust speeds. And then we, we look for an in-orbit demonstration. Hmm. So what are some of the uh, challenges that you're facing now in trying to get nuclear fusion engines so running? When you say the word fusion, uh, people immediately think, okay, 20 years from now. Um, Pulsar is very, very careful about not assuming uh, new feats in physics. Um, if, as an investor myself, as somebody who understands, I guess I come more from a, uh, a business side than I do from a physics side, um, it has to make sense. And I want to see companies take an achievable bit of physics or technology Go away and do that on time and on budget. Come back and say that we did what we said and avoid jumping down rabbit holes or becoming a very expensive science project. I think the biggest risk for an investor is that they find themselves funding a, a big science project. And, and that's not something that any investor wants to do. So Pulsar takes technology, uh, takes, so with, with Fusion, we take conditions that have already been achieved somewhere in the world. And we say we're going to repeat that. But we're going to do that in the, uh, the setup or configuration rather than for energy for propulsion. Um, we're not assuming that we can get a hundred times the temperature than what has been achieved at a government facility. I mean, it's a nice, bright, rosy future one day if you can. But if I was an investor, I would say not with my money. <laughs> uh, <laughs> we want to say this was done in this reactor by these people. Time has come on. We've got better tech. We want to achieve just the same thing, and then we'll come back to you. And 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 that's how we fund it. And and importantly, it's a different audience to to um, uh, power the power because there's a different set of interested parties. Because if I can sell a technology which gets you to a point in space, say at half the time as your competitor, whether it be a competitive country or a competitive business or whatever, uh, you know, you can charge for that. Um, and there are people that need to see if, the te if this technology is possible, because if it is, um, you know, they ha have to own a piece of that. And the, the simple thing is this, can humanity do fusion? If we can't, this is all a waste of time, but we can, we can do fusion. And if you can do fusion, then propulsion is inevitable. It's it's easier to get the particle speed because that same speed uh, is some, is the first step in energy. You know, if you want to do energy, you have to convert that speed into heat and then heat into power and all of this. And then you've got to have something that sustains itself and breeds its own fuels and becomes efficient. We don't need it to be efficient. We can buy our own fuel, pay someone to breed them because it's worth it. We can even sustain our reaction using a maybe efficient reactor if we wanted to, um, because ultimately if this if this it doesn't need to net generate, you know, I can lose money, but charge more because the speed is what I'm getting. Uh, so there are a lot of things going for it, but the biggest, I know you asked about challenges. I just want to get to the biggest yeah, yeah. advantage is that if you look at any fusion experiment, most of the money and the weight and the size of it is in getting vacuum equipment. You know, we have at Pulsar all these really expensive vacuum facilities. And, you know, you are a leak detector is half a million pounds, if not more. And you've got all these systems just to get a vacuum, a really high vacuum is seriously expensive and very challenging and can easily go wrong. And it has done in many fusion experiments. And then that's one part of it. Now, space is a vacuum. So it's perfect vacuum. So if, if, if you want to do a fusion experiment, space is the perfect place to do it. And you're going to save a ton of money and a ton of time doing the experiments in space. Secondly, the other side of any fusion, any fusion um, uh, project is usually you read about historic fusion uh, attempts and people go away, they raise some money. They come back and they say, we had a great result, but we would like some more money because we need bigger magnets. Uh, it's, it's magnet, magnetism is the other side of fusion. It's the muscle. It, it compensates for what we don't understand. You know, plasma in confinement is a bit like a weather system. It's chaos. Um, it's, uh, you know, it's, it's fluid dynamics. It's magnetic hydrodynamics. It's these incredibly complicated studies of a system we know we don't know anything about. So it's almost like the stock market 
if you think you know, you're going to get in trouble. <laughs> it's when you know you don't know that you can actually start doing something with it. And it's exactly the same with fusion inside the chamber. Once you realize you don't understand, but you can do tricks to compensate to, uh, you know, lots of little innovations that we've seen coming at universities that can just make the, the reaction more efficient, knowing that we don't understand. So um, the, the, the other side of that, of the understanding is magnets, because magnets, you can literally just power your way into confinement or control. And some people believe that sometimes magnetic power might just be get the studying the plasma, we're never going to understand it, just force it into submission with magnets. Uh, and you can get there. However, magnets, superconducting, you know, rare earth ma magnets are, they need to be kept at a very, very low temperature. Right. And that is expensive. You're going to run liquid nitrogen through the space is zero Kelvin. So, right. so well, not everywhere, but where we're using it, it is, that's minus 275 degrees. It's the perfect place to have superconducting magnets. So effectively, putting fusion in space may originally make people raise eyebrows, but I am so much better off doing it there than doing it on Earth, exactly. and I'll be a, a lot quicker. Right. Challenges? Uh, I guess our major challenge right now is, I guess, demonstrating it, not um, coming back with a... And they, what we don't want to do is raise money from investors and then promise something and not deliver it, which is something so far we haven't done, but we've got a long way to go. And, you know, I don't want to be coming back to you in a couple of years' time and say, oh, guess what? We almost had a great talk. But we're very, very disciplined as a team. Um, and I think we we know, I like to say we, we have a good chance of of hitting our milestones along the way, which will mean that by 2027, we would be fundraising for an in-orbit demonstration. Uh, so we, we right now we have the chamber in our facilities in England. Um, we've also got, because of the Eurofusion uh, drive and, and, and ETER, uh, a huge um, talent pool of, of nuclear fusion and, and plasma physicists in England, which is why it's such a good infusion. So we, we've got everything we need to, to get that static test done, but we'll be spending a lot of money on magnets and a lot of money on, on our vacuum equipment. We have to. Come 2027, we want to say to our aerospace partners, the people we already sell equipment to, because we listen to them and we know that they want fusion propulsion. It is one of the things they are most interested in in our portfolio. And if they, you know, if, if we come up with a technology that they don't want, we don't invest in it. You know, we don't have a dream that we want to build something and people are going to want it. We say they don't want it, we don't want to build it, but they want this. So we, we keep them involved in the game and we invite them to come and see these tests at low temperature higher temperature. The thing is, we, we build this all to scale, because I think that if you build something on a tabletop and say it's a big aerospace firm, do you want to come look at it? They'll say, well, it's not really the size that you would need it. So it might be interesting, but it's, you know, so our, our, our experiments are full size, um, as if the real rocket, and we'll start with a low temperature plasma. I say low temperature, I mean a couple of million uh, degrees. And then as we bring up our magnetic power, we will get towards fusion temperature. And then we will show those exhaust speeds to our, our as the people in the, in the space sector, and and, uh, and then hopefully we will they will see the sense in putting this in orbit, um, which I, I think there's a, a, a very good case for. Excellent. And finally, what is your biggest hope for this technology for the future? What do you hope it brings about? In terms of change for yeah. people for yeah yeah you know for me there's there's all sorts of positive impacts but why what drives me to do this um yeah. you know it, it's a it's sometimes it's like when you know something is possible uh it becomes almost irresistible um but you've got to be very careful <laughs> because just because to quote jurassic park uh, so sometimes your scientists have got to ask not just whether they could, but whether or not they should. Um, and, and in this case, uh, it comes down to the fact that humanity could be um, a, a nasty little defect of um, the, you know, something that this one planet has, has humaned and um, 
it's just not normal and we're gonna we're like a cancerous little species that will a planet's got to cough off and get rid of um maybe or you know maybe many many planets have humans you know the um the world the universe works in a way where it says i tell you what something may be very very unlikely that have a hundred trillion 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 suns all planeting and the numbers will be there mm -hmm. uh so maybe but we don't know that we're, we're like a child growing up alone we don't have other a big brother we don't we can't look at a human species that's maybe a hundred thousand years old or or we don't have a little planet over there that's only got we can say ah well they are where we were uh 20 000 years ago we mm -hmm. because of light speed effectively we're that child growing up alone with a lot of insecurities about it because we don't know oh look we're in our teens and we still smoke and we know we shouldn't and we're kind of getting better but we're you know we're we can't look at it and say that old mature wise civilization that they have learned how to find a planet near them and they put a responsible civilization you know they know how many people it can sustain and they power it properly and that's a mature human species and we will one day get like that so insecurities for me fusion technology is that is a milestone in us growing up as a species mm. it's our ability to emulate what the stars are doing knowing that okay we've learned and we've set fire to stuff and we've we've definitely made a mess but now we're doing what the stars are doing what the sun is doing and we're copying nature and we're using it a to power our planet ultimately sustainably for so long as there is humanity but also we are if you look at that little or forget all the grand talk if you go right back to the lab and you see a fusion burn that is the promise that we are that species that that can leave our solar system maybe not maybe we don't send people maybe maybe we send embryos or maybe we send uh a, uh, a system AI that powered probes a ai powered or maybe we send something that goes across to alpha centauri who's about 4.2 light years away and and that then breeds humans but only enough on that who knows but that reaction that fusion reaction which we've done means we are that species and that is pretty extraordinary that is indeed pretty extraordinary well, thanks so much for being on the show, Richard. It was a pleasure talking with you. My pleasure. Love to have you back anytime. Thank you. And that was Richard Dynan, founder and CEO of Pulsar Fusion. As we leap from the moon to the rust-colored landscapes of Mars, we embark on our boldest endeavor yet, bringing humans in large numbers to another world. The red planet holds tantalizing secrets of its past, and it beckons us to make it our new home away from home. The journey to Mars is not for the faint-hearted, and robotic missions will pave the way for human settlers. Human habitats are likely to be combinations of underground shelters and 3D printed structures, offering protection from both cosmic radiation as well as other extreme conditions. Living sustainably on Mars means harnessing local resources, generating oxygen from the carbon dioxide in the atmosphere, and growing food using Martian soil or hydroponics. With fusion-powered spacecraft propelling us through the vastness of space, our journeys to the Red Planet will become more feasible and faster than ever before. Reduced travel time means space travelers can spend more time on the Martian surface, conducting in-depth scientific research and laying the groundwork for future generations of explorers. The technological marvels we create to live in space will not only enrich our lives in the cosmos, but also revolutionize life back on Earth. Advanced recycling systems will reduce waste and pollution, and innovations in healthcare and life support systems will improve medical care for everyone. The space economy is gonna flourish creating jobs and opportunities that we can't yet imagine. Zero-G Yoga Instructor Alien Virologist Interplanetary Gaming Champion 
Our destiny is entwined with the stars, and it is up to us to make this vision of humanity moving beyond our planetary cradle a reality. Together, we can traverse the cosmos, build new homes on distant worlds, and forge a future that shines as brightly as the stars themselves. So let us set forth on this grand journey, hand in hand, to turn our cosmic dreams into an awe-inspiring, extraordinary reality. Next week on The Cosmic Companion, we're going to discuss two of the greatest mysteries in the universe. If a word is misspelled in the dictionary, how would we know? Why is it called a building if it's already built? Can you buy an entire chest set in a pawn shop? If a vampire bites a zombie, does the zombie become a vampire, or does the vampire become a zombie? Dark matter and dark energy, which make up about 95% of, well, everything out there. We'll be talking with Rene LaRace, project scientist on the Euclid mission, recently launched by the European Space Agency. Make sure to join us on the 12th of August. If you enjoyed this episode of The Cosmic Companion, gee thanks! Please download, share, and tell all your friends all over the universe about this show, okay? It's much appreciated. Clear skies.